Okay, uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, twice in this uh, wonderful conference. So, if I ask the audience which one is the simplest uh, quantum field theory, interacting quantum field theory in four dimensions, you're probably going to answer N equals four super young mills. And you're probably right. However, in this talk, I want to introduce you to a new model, a model that uh, most of you uh, have probably never heard of. Uh, but it has a lot of interesting features, and one can argue, one can argue that it's also among the simplest uh, interacting quantum field theories that you can consider. It is a model uh, with n equals to 2 SUSI instead of n equals 4. And what we're uh, going to try to do is uh, to try to bootstrap it. So let's have a quick overview of the bootstrap techniques that we've discussed uh, in the previous lectures. So we have, of course, uh, the classic example of uh, Virasoro symmetry, the success story of the bootstrap program. We have the numerical techniques. Uh, we have the solvable truncation present in uh, supersymmetric models that Madalena just told you about. And there is also, also another approach uh, uh, which has been very successful, which is called the analytic bootstrap. And uh, we didn't have uh, lectures on this subject, but it's a very interesting uh, subfield, uh, if you want. And the idea is that uh, CFTs in the limit of large spin uh, simplify. So you can, do, uh, you can solve CFTs in the limit of large spin, and then you can calculate corrections. Uh, in as inverse powers of, of 1 over L, of, of 1 over the spin. So in a sense, all of these techniques are, gonna, are going to play a role in this talk. So we're going to try to solve this theory from all possible fronts. So let's start then by mimicking a calculation that, that Madalena just did. So n equals to 2 theories have an R symmetry current, which sits in the same multiplet as the stress tensor. So if you study these uh, correlators of these R-symmetry currents in, in four dimensions, you're also morally studying the, the, the stress tensor, so that's the power of supersymmetry. That in a sense, this correlator is a bit simpler because it has uh, operators with just one uh, Lorentz index. And of course, solving this beast in four dimensions is, is a challenge. And we're nowhere near, uh, I don't know how many years in the future we will need in order to solve this thing in complete generality. However, thanks to these solvable, solvable truncations, we can solve a slice. So we can solve this guy in a two-dimensional two -dimensional slice, since, thanks to this chiral algebra construction. And the resulting correlator is something that you can read in the textbooks. So I solved the slice, thanks to the construction that uh, Madalena just introduced to you. And then I can use uh, this solution, I can expand it in four-dimensional blocks, and I can solve for OPE coefficients. Again, I'm mimicking the previous talk. Unitarity uh, of the four-dimensional theory implies an analytic bound uh, for the spectral charge. And the assumptions were minimal. We assume that uh, our four-dimensional theory has n equals to superconformal symmetry. We assume the existence of a stress tensor. And uh, we also assume, uh, even though I didn't specify, that the theory is interacting. Uh, because if you assume that the theory is interacting, it means that there are no higher spin current due to a sort of theorem by Maldacen and Sivodeyev, and therefore you can solve for, for this OPE coefficient. So the question now uh, that was posed in the n equals 3 case, you can also pose it in, in n equals 2, is this theory, uh, is this bound saturated by a known theory? And so if you go uh, through the n equals 2 literature, there is a very special family of theories, uh, which I call, the, the, there is no uh, standard nomenclature, but I call them the canonical rank one theories. So they are theories uh, that have uh, one-dimensional Coulomb branches, and I'm going to review uh, soonish uh, what the Coulomb branch is. And they have flavor symmetries. So these, uh, 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 in n equals to two theories, you can have flavor symmetries. These are just flavor groups, the exceptional. This is just an SO8. And the notation that people use is a bit funny. These are just SUN. So this one is SU3, this one is SU2, and this one doesn't have uh, flavor symmetry. So these theories uh, have been con have, uh, can be constructed in many ways. Uh, 
by using cyber wind technology and also as a low energy free theories of, of uh, brains in F theory. And uh, people have calculated their central charges. So, as I said, this is a very, a very special family of n equals to two theories. They have flavor uh, symmetry, so this case, the flavor central charge. And you can see that the 11 over 30, uh, our bound uh, appears here. So it seems that our bound is actually, uh, it, it, it not it seems, our bound is actually optimal. It's as good as it's going to get. Because with this minimal set of assumptions, you just cannot rule known theories. And it turned out that uh, the theory uh, that we are now sort of discovering with bootstrap techniques, uh, it seems to be also the simplest of this list because it doesn't have flavor. So most of these theories uh, are strongly interacting with no known Lagrangian description. The only one that has a Lagrangian description is this one, which is an SU2 uh, super QCD, in which the uh, flavor group gets enhanced. So uh, there are very few techniques in order to study these theories, which means that uh, the bootstrap is, is, is really uh, the only game in town. So uh, what's the name of this theory? It, it doesn't have a name. So we, we uh, I mean, it has several names. I'm going to call it uh, the simplest and equals to theory. And it's... Uh, uh, it belongs to a family of theories uh, that's called uh, argyris douglas theories. So I don't know how to call it. I'm going to call it the argyris douglas theory, the simplest argyris douglas theory, um, the simplest and equals to SCFT. So this is the theory that I wanted to uh, introduce to you. It is an n equals to two fixed points with many nice features. And so uh, let's start. Uh, Madalena told you that any n equals to two theory has a solvable subsector. So what is the chiral algebra associated uh, with this theory? So let's do a little calculation. The dictionary tells you that the uh, central charge of the two-dimensional theory is minus the central charge of the four. So minus 22 over 5. Do you recognize that number? What is it? It's the young Lee singularity. So this is very important because I, I'm building the case that this theory is, is, is really a very simple quantum field theory, even though it's strongly interacting and we don't have a Lagrangian description. We know that any n equals to two theory has a solvable subsector. And the solvable subsector of this theory is the young Lee model, which is really the simplest minimal model that you can think of. It has only one primary. So uh, this uh, conjecture, if you want, that the, that the solvable model is the, is the Young Lee model, is not just a matching of, of the central charges. One can push it a bit more. Uh, the dictionary, this 4D2D dictionary, uh, tells you that the vacuum character of, of the 2D theory uh, has to be equal to something that is called the sure limit of the superconformal index. Uh, if you if you are an expert and know these things, good. If you don't know these things, uh, it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you that there is more. There is a lot of evidence that the Young Lee model is indeed the subsector associated to this theory. In particular, for the Schur index, uh, one can take uh, a certain limit. We know that the index exhibits something called Cardi behavior, so one can take some certain limit of the superconformal index and read uh, the A anomaly coefficient. So I only talk, I, I talk about the C anomaly coefficient, but there's also an A anomaly coefficient. And uh, you can read it, for example, from the vacuum character of the Young Lee model, and you get this number, which is actually the correct number. People have calculated uh, the A anomaly coefficient for this Argyris Douglas model, and this is the correct value. So uh, it is a simple theory. Uh, one argument is because it has the simplest possible uh, to the chiral algebra. The modular space uh, is also very simple, so n equals to two theories have a modular space of vacuum. So for Lagrangian theories, you can think of them as, as, as the minimum of the, of the potential. In n equals to two theories, uh, the modular space of vacuum, you can genetically divide it in something called the Higgs branch and some, something called the Coulomb branch. This theory doesn't have a Higgs branch. 
And uh, the Coulomb branch is very simple. It's generated uh, by a single scalar, parameterized by the web of one single scalar. And on top of that, we know the dimension of this single scalar. Supersymmetry is very powerful and gives us that the scalar, uh, the chiral field in this theory, the scalar is chiral, has 6 over 5. So which means that I can actually implement the bootstrap. So uh, Madalena talked about the two-step process. In a sense, we solve the, fir the, the first step. We identify uh, the protected subsector that gives us a lot of information about the theory, tons of uh, OPE coefficients and, and conformal dimensions. And now uh, we would like now to access uh, information that is not given by supersymmetry. So up to this point, we run out of luck. Uh, we fix as many, as much as, as, much as, we, as we can for this uh, theory analytically. And now we're going to implement uh, the numerical bootstrap. So at this point, I am going from Madalena mode, and now I'm going, going to Connors mode. This is basically uh, the same uh, equations that Connor showed you four-point function, and now the small difference now is that this guy is a supersymmetric correlator. So this correlator has a block expansion, but now it's a superconformal block expansion. What is a superconformal block? We know that in supersymmetric theories, different bosonic families are related by the different supercharges. So a superblock is a sum of bosonic blocks in which this coefficient here uh, is fixed by supersymmetry. So this is very important. If you want to do the supersymmetric bootstrap, you really need to calculate here uh, the proper coefficients. If you, do, if you don't calculate this coefficient and you just put uh, this in the computer, you're not doing supersymmetry. In order to do the supersymmetric bootstrap, you really have to calculate these guys. And calculating these guys is, is actually not that easy. However, for this... Uh, correlator that we're going to study, the chiral field, uh, the blocks are known. We're calculating in 2014. But in general, if you want to study more general correlators and in more uh, generic supersymmetric field theories, uh, the blocks are not known. So there's a lot of research to be done. There's a lot of superconformal uh, block technology to be developed. So great. So uh, let's start fixing uh, CFT data. So we have two channels. Uh, the uh, channels in which I fuse phi and phi bar. The first operator is the identity, and the second operator uh, is the stress tensor. There is a chiral channel in which the first operator, I can call it by definition, phi square, and then uh, this is a family of, of operators. The name uh, has its origin in supersymmetry. Uh, you can ignore it. It's just an infinite family of operators uh, labeled by the spin, spin 2, 4, 6, 8, up to infinity. And they have protected dimensions, but the OPE coefficients are not protected. So these guys have protected dimensions, but the OPE coefficients are not protected. So this is data uh, that we would like to bootstrap. And it uh, can actually be done uh, using the techniques that Connor used and also that uh, Madalena explained to you in the introductory lecture. And uh, so, for example, the OPE coefficient of this guy, of the stress sensor, is related to the central charge. So let's look at this plot. It's a, it's a bound on the minimal possible value uh, of the central charge. And uh, this axis is, is the numerics, uh, how far we can push the numerics. This is the 11 over 30 that defines our theory. And as you can see, numerically, we're not there. We would like to prove numerically that the minimum uh, central charge value allowed by this bootstrap equation is this 11 over 30. We got all the way here. But uh, if you extrapolate, it seems that if uh, we get a big enough computer, maybe, I don't know, a quantum computer, uh, we're going to be able to get to this uh, 11 over 30. So, it seems plausible that actually our numerics indeed is going to converge to the theory that we want to bootstrap. So I bootstrap this OPE coefficient. One can also bootstrap uh, this OPE coefficient here. And uh, this is the, these are the results. Again, 
With better numerics, this thing, uh, we can put upper and lower bounds in this case. With better numerics, this thing is moving to the right. The 11 over 30 is here, so we're not there yet. Ideally, we would like this thing really to move all the way to here, so that you can really corner the theory. But still, uh, we do have this uh, sort of uh, uh, precise prediction. Now, from the point of view of the bootstrap, this is just an extra OPE coefficient. However, for people that like uh, n equals to 2 theories, this is very important. It's, it's related to the Coulomb branch chiral ring of n equals to 2 theories, and there's uh, a lot of technology being developed to calculate this, t this type of thing. So you have phi phi and then phi squared. It belongs to the chiral ring. Now, most of the techniques that have been developed are for Lagrangian theories. This theory, as I told you, is a strongly interacting fixed point with no Lagrangian description. So uh, it's a very strong uh, prediction from the bootstrap. So for the people that really like these things, uh, the chiral ring event of oh, n equals to two theories, we have a prediction for them. This uh, quantity should be between these two values. We proved it numerically. I mean, we calculated it numerically. Now it would be very nice if someone can uh, find some analytic uh, results. Uh, so great, so this is uh, our first piece of CFD data that we are uh, bootstrapping. Uh, I have one more result to you to, uh, to try to convince you that we can actually, uh, the numerics is working uh, okay for this theory. I would like to uh, bootstrap out these OPE coefficients. This is an infinite family of OPE coefficients. But before showing you that result, I want to give you a glimpse of, of what's called uh, the Lycon bootstrap, this uh, technology in, in which uh, we study theories at large spin. Because, as I just said, these coefficients, these operators are labeled by the spin, L equals 2, 4, 5, until infinity. But we do have techniques to calculate these guys, analytic techniques to calculate these guys when the spin is very large. And uh, the nicest result in this line of thinking is it's very recent. It's an inversion formula uh, obtained by uh, Simon Caron Huot. This equation is very schematic, but basically what it tells you is that you can solve for the CFT data once you know the correlator. So if you give me the correlator, we know because there is a conformal block expansion, one can, in principle, extract uh, OPE coefficients and conformal dimensions. But uh, uh, to do that might not be that easy. And, uh, and Simon gave an inversion formula. So you might say uh, this formula, well, maybe it's not that useful because I need the actual correlator in order to solve for the CFD data. And, and we don't know this thing. However, uh, we do know some things, right? We do know that uh, the OP that I showed you before is that when you have the OP between a field and its complex conjugate, the first operator that appears is the identity. And we also know quite generically that the second operator that appears is the stress tensor. So uh, this means that I can replace this expansion here and I can start obtaining uh, CFT data on the other side. Of course, if I want the full uh, answer, I need to put everything. But even putting a one here already gives you some uh, information. And in particular, it gives you information for L big. So this is the industry that is known as the, as the uh, Lycoon bootstrap. You put a bit of information of one side of crossing, and then you get information of the other side, which is valid for, for very large spins. So that's what we did. We, uh, I told you that we were going to attack this theory from all possible fronts. We study uh, these OPE coefficients, this CFT data, numerically for spin 2, 4, 6, 8, until our computer died. And then we studied it uh, analytically using the Lycon bootstrap techniques, and in particular, uh, this inversion formula obtained by Simon Caron Huot. And so these are the results. Uh, this one is uh, the numerical bounds, these two bars here. And you can see that the analytic result uh, goes uh, between the bars. Here, you cannot tell, but they also agree very nicely. Here, for spin uh, zero, it doesn't work, but 
you are expecting, uh, we are expecting that this uh, dashed line is, is, is valid only for large spin. But it's still quite remarkable that, that even for very low spins, uh, both types of approaches are, are quite consistent. So we're really like, again, as I said, attacking the theory from numerically for low spin and analytically for large spin. And both results are, are quite consistent. So we, we can really claim that we're, we did, we made the first step towards uh, really bootstrapping this theory and, and extracting its, its CFT data. So uh, to conclude, uh, I introduce you to a new model, uh, some, some, uh, a challenger for, for N equals for super young wheel theory as uh, the simplest uh, interacting uh, quantum field theory. It has N equals to two symmetry. Symmetry, it has a lot of simplifying features. It doesn't have flavor symmetry, for example. The modular space structure is very simple. It does have a solvable subsector as all N equals to two theories have, and in particular, the solvable subsector for this theory is, is the simplest minimal model that you can think of. Uh, we gave the first step towards bootstrapping this theory, in particular because this external dimension, 6 over 5, is a very uh, small value, so the numerics work uh, very nice. We found a very nice agreement between the numerical results and the results obtained analytically. But of course, we, we would like to do more. We would like to improve the numerics. In particular, we would like these uh, two upper and lower bounds to go as close to possible. Uh, one can also start thinking about adding extra operators on this side and find uh, better uh, results uh, for a large spin uh, results that, I mean, corrections, one over L corrections to the results that I showed you. And then uh, the other uh, thing missing, in the, which is endemic to the supersymmetric bootstrap, is that we need uh, to calculate superconformal blocks. So this, in a sense, is still a very simple correlator. We would like to put other types of operators, spinning operators, for example, etc. And for that, uh, we need to calculate uh, more block technology. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, since the Yang Li's theory is a subsector, Yes. And it's non-unitary. Does that mean that this theory is non-unitary? No. No, 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 no. The, 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 the four-dimensional theory is always unitary. And actually imposing a unitarity of the four-dimensional theory, it is uh, how we obtain this bound. Uh, but you have to be careful when you go from the 2D to the 4D. Sometimes there are some minus signs in the relationship between 2D OP coefficient and 4D OP coefficient. But the four-dimensional theory has to be unitary. That's uh, by assumption. Yes. Seems like you, you were saying that there's some discrepancy. That no, no, no. I, in n equals zero, n equals zero, uh, the thing was starting to, uh, not too good, uh, so good. But th there are some things that I should say. First, both our application of the, there are corrections. I, we did the first step both in the numerics and the analytics. The numerics can get better. We can really uh, sandwich these things. And then maybe the analytic curve is going to go outside our numerical bounds. But there are also more corrections on the analytic side that we need to include. So in a sense, I kind of cheated a bit because I did like the first order calculations on both sides. And they match. But then, if I want to improve, I have to improve on both sides. The second comment that I want to make that I didn't say is that, indeed, as you said, Caron Huot's formula, it's valid for spin greater than 2. It seems that in supersymmetric theories, it has a higher range of validity. And uh, you, you can look at the form of the block. And if you mimic Simon's calculation, it seems that when you have supersymmetric blocks, you can improve the range of validity. And there's also a more heuristic argument is that in supersymmetric theories, we know that spin two things are related to things with spin zero, right? You can act with supercharges. So somehow it is expected that in supersymmetric theory, Simon's formula is going to have a higher range of validity, bigger range of validity, because it's valid for spin two, but we know that in supersymmetric theories, there is a spin zero guy that is probably related uh, to this spin two guy. Uh, 
Yeah, it was not that bad. It was outside the numerical uh, range, but it was still, uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, sure. But as I said, we have to improve uh, on both sides. Um, a quick question. You had a plot on figure 10, a slide 10 or something? Yes. What was the computing power that went into that? Uh, the one before, on 12, yeah, 10. Uh, well, we, we measure things in terms of this parameter lambda, these derivatives. Actually, I don't remember. 40 derivatives? Did we get to 40 derivatives? Lambda 40? I, I don't remember. In, for, in, this, in this big lambda, which is becoming sort of the standard uh, parameter in the bootstrap literature, we got to lambda, lambda equals 40. This was, I mean, all done on like your... Uh desktop or laptop or something or no no this is done in computing clusters oh no no way you can do this thing in a laptop this is done in computing clusters yes germans have a lot of clusters so we we're good uh, loga uh, just a question uh, maybe maybe you had already uh, said so is it understood this uh, karan Huwat's formula and this chiral algebra approach how they go together? Like, if you if you put the chiral algebra into the Karen Huat formula, can you say something or? Uh, good question. Uh, oh, I have to think. But uh, does it say I, something new, or does it just reproduce some two D uh, representation theory? Yeah, I mean, the chiral algebra, of course, is 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 crossing symmetry on its own. So the question is. What happens with Simon's formula in D equals to 2? I think it works. I th actually, in, in, in his original paper, to check his formula, he used the Ising model. So if you just put the chiral larger on its own, yeah, my guess is that it's going to satisfy Simon's formula on its own. Think so. just a, Madalena. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, point out one. So you were asking about the convergent down to and, uh, in. The argument Pedro said actually does not really apply for this plot, so this is actually surprising. It works. A priori, it didn't have to work for this plot. So here we have exactly Simon's result. It should work from spin 2 onwards. It's close. Maybe this particular four-point function is nicer behaved than the bound Simon could show, but we have no understanding of if this should hold for spin 0 or not in this bound. It holds in the other channel, but not in this one. Yeah, his, his formula actually, uh, actually works for the 2D Ising model for uh, L equal to zero as well. Exactly. And th there the is some thing. cancellation that happens uh, in that the particular case. Of the, of the correlation function in this regi limit is better. We don't know if this is the case here or not. And the supersymmetry argument uh, holds in some channels, but it actually doesn't hold in this one because it's the chiral channel. Uh, yes, so indeed. So the thing is, this channel uh, is supersymmetric. This channel for from each supersymmetric multiplet, only one operator contributes. So actually, as Madalena just said, indeed, this channel is sort of Poissonian. So in this channel, indeed, Simon's formula uh, just just uh, is just applies. The comment that I made regarding the a bigger range of validity is indeed uh, for this channel where we have superconformal blocks. Um, is that there? Just a technical question. So, so the uh, the plot uh, one over lambda. Uh, so. Yes. So here, uh, how does the cost scale? It's like some power of lambda or exponential. No one knows. I think. No one knows. Yes, we are. In the Butzer community, we put linear extrapolations, and they seem to work, especially because we want to believe that the. Uh, I meant uh, uh, for fixed lambda. Uh, what is the cost? So when you increase lambda by factor two. Is it like factor over eight or exponent? Yeah, I don't know. I have to think. Sorry, oh, on the okay. spot. And also, I wonder if it's a easily parallelizable problem. Yes. Or easily yes. parallelizable. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Any other questions? If not, let's thank all the speakers for this session.